And right now it's time for that time when we have our special guest. Tonight's special guest is the man from Investigate magazine, Ian Wisher. And tonight we talk about Ian's new book, The Inside Story. After a great deal of research and investigation, Ian comes up with a name. Find out tonight who killed the crew. We welcome Ian Wishart as our special guest on The Beat Goes On. Ian Wishart, welcome for 2011 to The Beat Goes On. Hey, send me back. You're back for a wonderful reason. I've been wanting to talk to you about this since September, the inside story, Arthur Allen Thomas. But you were a, you were a boy of about uh, six or seven when this first started. What's, what's the interest from your point of view, Ian? Well, it was always one of New Zealand's uh, great murder mysteries, and I think it shaped um, the views of a generation in terms of uh, uh, showing that the police could be fallible. Uh, of course, the Royal Commission inquiry in the early 80s found that they'd uh, uh, been guilty of misconduct. So it's, it's been hanging over the country for a long time and, and uh, 2010 was the 40th anniversary of yes. the crew murders. So uh, uh, you had North and South magazine come out and did their special on the crew murders and then Arthur Allen Thomas got in contact and said, look, everyone else has had a go at this but I haven't told my story, I'd like to tell my story. So I said, absolutely fine. So we went down, I saw him for several weeks and we did interviews every day wow. and uh, got access to all of his old files and so forth right from the word go. And uh, we put together the book, and uh, it was interesting because I had, as a journalist, worked on the periphery of the case for a long time, but it was the first time I had this sort of bird's eye view of what was actually going on inside. Well, some people say, let sleeping dogs lie. What, is it, what does it matter anymore? That's, that's another age. But it's not, is it? Justice has to be done. Justice has to be done, and the reality is if it was your parents mm. who'd been killed and the killer never brought to justice, whether it happened yesterday two weeks ago, a month ago, 12 months ago, 12 years ago. Does that make the crime any less significant and does it mean that we just forgive killers if they can stay on the, on the run for long enough? Uh, fundamentally with the Arthur Allen Thomas case, if as the new book suggests a police officer was actually the killer, um, that says something terrible about the state of our justice system and the, and the power of a person to corrupt a police investigation and steer it away from himself as a guilty party. Um, and that's something we should all be afraid of because if he can do it to Arthur Allen Thomas, that person can do it to anybody. Um, there are some who say that, uh, oh, well, it's a terrible thing to say about a police officer. You know, the reality is we're all human. Mm. There's nothing magical about being a police officer any more than, you know, occasionally you find that there's somebody in the fire service who's an arsonist and has been lighting the fires. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, uh, these things happen. Mm. And you can't rule something out purely on the basis of we like all police officers, therefore they can't possibly be, be guilty or, or above suspicion. They're human, just like you and I. If you and I can be suspects, so can they. Um, this particular police officer, Len Johnson, was instrumental and the Royal Commission found that he had basically fabricated evidence that had uh, convicted Arthur Allen Thomas. But we now find that Len Johnson knew Jeanette Crew prior to her murder, uh, that he had uh, been called in to investigate uh, what was believed to have been a, uh, an insurance fraud perpetrated by the crews and that he must have realised this and possibly begun to blackmail them. Um, that he, as a police officer, uh, was prone to threatening even his colleagues he set one of them up for mm. arson. Um, he lit a fire on the uh, Idaho police station and then tried to blame his colleague who he didn't like as lighting the fire. Um, that man's now a high profile lawyer in this town. And uh, so Johnson has a psychopathic personality from those I've spoken to who knew him. And uh, he turns out to possibly have taken a shine to Jeanette and maybe that's where this all went, that he knew that they'd committed an insurance fraud uh, with their alleged burglary. And he said, well, if you don't play ball, uh, show me some favours or maybe pay me some mm. hush money, then things are going to get a lot worse. Well, what you had after the burglary was uh, uh, two more arson attacks on the house, one of them on Rochelle Crew's bedroom. Um, you had, uh, and this has never been previously released um, up until the time of this book, uh, you had a, another attempt on Jeanette Crew's life uh, where somebody cut the brakes on her car. Um, all of this is, is relevant and you can come back to the issue of, well, you know, is this something that uh, some hick old farmer who mm. could barely add two and two together sort of thing in terms of his uh, skills in that area is, is likely to have done uh, in the last contact he had with Jeanette was sort of eight years earlier? Mm. Or is this um, somebody who's got a much more recent attachment to the woman mm. and is, is pursuing a stalking her in a sense? Now, as you sat there during these uh, two weeks, was it, or three weeks, you said mm. that you, you did the interviews 
Did you see it, feel yourself as ideas changing and the more and more information you heard? What were your feelings as you heard all this information? Uh, what was going through your head? Well, I was astounded at, I, you know, like everybody, and this is the thing about a book, uh, as opposed to an interview or a news report or, any, or a TV report, um, we can see things on TV and, and on the daily news and so forth, and it's there for 90 seconds and you get the general gist of something. Um, but it's not till you get into the fine detail mm. that you realise the, the depth and the subtle nuances that existed and so forth and the real information that's out there. And often, you know, we look at all of us in the morning paper and we flick it over and we, say, we think we've got something sus because we've read it in the paper. There's a lot more to it. And the same with the Arthur Allen Thomas case. Despite being a journalist, uh, despite having covered aspects of this case in the past, despite having interviewed Arthur Allen Thomas 20-odd 20, 20 years ago, um, despite a whole host of things, I thought I knew the case. I didn't know the case at all. Wow. You know, yeah. and going through the boxes of evidence and mm. the, the contemporary reports and so forth that were written and the uh, affidavits and the, the uh, court transcripts and the like, I quickly got a sense of a lot of stuff that had been missed in the, in the mm. general news reporting. And um, of course, with the stuff that Arthur was telling me, it, was, it uh, painted a new picture. And I'd actually gone into the book um, thinking that we possibly had solved the crime earlier than that because mm. we had a, a piece in, in the magazine uh, in 2008 which uh, had the first new details of a potential suspect in the Thomas case since, uh, mm. basically since 1970. And uh, it wasn't, you know, I went into the book assuming that, that person was probably the, the prime suspect. I came away from the end of the book, they're still a suspect, mm. they're no longer the prime suspect, and that's how things can change. Can change I was, can't they? I, it was, wasn't until I went through and I looked at all the mm. evidence and all the psychological profiling and so forth, and I realised that there was only one person I could actually really sort of point the finger at in terms of the in available information, that was Detective Len Johnson. Mm. And that surprised me. I was not expecting mm. to point the finger at a police officer as, mm. as being the potential killer of the, of the crews. Mm. Um, and yet that's where the evidence leads. Now it might be that there's somebody else. It yeah. might be that there's somebody who hasn't yet been identified in any way, shape or form who was the killer of the crews. But in terms of the evidence available to date, the best evidence is suggesting that a police officer killed the crews and then framed Arthur Allen Thomas. And the other big question, who fed the baby? Yeah, well, that's again an issue. For a long time, um, people have mm. presumed, because of uh, various theories that have come out, that uh, Jeanette's father, Len Demler, was actually the killer. Mm. Uh, or if not the killer, then he was the person who removed the bodies and helped feed the baby. Um, for reasons that will become apparent once people actually read the book, and I had to develop this thesis and, and line of reasoning and take people through the evidence for and against, uh, but it will become pretty clear when people have read the book, Len Demler could not have been the person who either killed his daughter mm -hmm. or moved the bodies, um, particularly Harvey who weighed 13 odd stone uh, yeah. and was a, an absolute dead weight and uh, I doubt very much that as a father that he uh, smashed his daughter's head into the point where her entire skull was fractured right round like an egg and oh. all her teeth were missing. Who could been. do that to their daughter? Well that's the thing, I mean yeah. uh, particularly over the motive that the, 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 uh, the critics had suggested which was purely the will and uh, I, I couldn't see that happening. But as the conspiracy theory went, Demler had done it and his uh, new girlfriend had been the woman who had uh, fed, the, fed baby. the baby. And again, as I point out in the book, there are very good reasons to show that she wasn't and he didn't. Mm -hmm. And therefore it brings us back to, uh, well if it is a police officer in the form of Len Johnson, was there a woman that he held some sort of power or control over that he could do it? Now I can tell you and your viewers tonight for the first time publicly, and this hasn't been released anywhere, but as a result of the book coming out, we had uh, a whole lot of new information come to hand and I've, I've given this to the police mm. investigation as well. Mm. Um, and there was a woman who rang me and she said I was newlywed in uh, June 1970 and uh, my husband and I took his parents out to Pukikawa for the day just to you know, have a visit in the country. We went up to the top of the hill at Pukikawa that overlooks the, mm. the settlement and she said when we got up there, this was the Sunday before the bodies were discovered missing on the Monday, she said we got up there and we saw a, a, a big brown truck and uh, three people, a man and two women, uh, standing at various corners scanning the countryside and uh, she said the women looked kind of frightened and uh, you know it was strange but my father-in-law being the gregarious Kiwi guy, mm. he hopped out of the car and the first thing he did is go up to the, the older guy and, and offer to shake his hand and so forth and how are you and the guy basically told him where to, where to go really? and didn't yeah. want to speak to him at all. Mm. And uh, their family found this very strange. In 1970s New Zealand, it wasn't how you did things. Oh. And they got a very bad vibe about things. And the, the people weren't talking, they were just looking, scanning the area where the farmhouse was, incidentally. 
So the family uh, got in their car after a few minutes and, and drove off. Well, the next day the news broke of the farmhouse being discovered bloodstained and, and no parents inside and the missing and the baby found in the cot. And the police issued a public appeal for anybody who'd seen anything suspicious in the Pukekawa area to yeah. come forward. So both the uh, uh, daughter and the father-in-law uh, decided to speak to police and uh, uh, wanted to speak to police and say what they'd seen. Well, the father-in-law was the first one to the phone. He speaks to the Otahu police and a detective told him, your information is not relevant and I don't want you to call back and never mention it again, please. Now you tell me, on day one of a police mm. investigation to a murder where they're appealing for public information, mm. why a detective at Otahu, where Len Johnson was based, would tell a witness with material information to get lost. Could it have been Len Johnson that answered the phone that day? could day? well have been. Yes, exactly. Well, well, the, well the switchboard would have put, put, put them through, through to, to somebody. The, yeah. on the team. Now, so what uh, position did Len Johnson hold in the investigation? He was a detective sergeant. Uh, in the first phase of the investigation, he was simply based at Otahu and didn't play an active role from what we can see in the yeah. homicide inquiry. Um, he was brought in at a later stage when uh, they were looking for axles and evidence to fit up well, Arthur Allen Thomas. Yeah. Um, but certainly he was based at Otahu, so he mm. was in a position to be there. And, and again, I, I've, as I said to the police and, uh, superintendent conducting the uh, police inquiry, uh, can you think of a rational explanation as to why one of your detectives on day one of a murder inquiry where you have just issued a public appeal for information would turn witnesses away? Mm. Um, why would that happen? And that was again a pattern that Len Johnson used that similar phrase in the book with other witnesses and basically in one, one case threatened to kill them if uh, they, they came forward. So you have this pattern of behaviour that uh, suggests that something was seriously awry, which would only make sense if that particular police officer was involved in this crime. Bring me up to um, date on Len Johnson. What's happened to him? Len Johnson uh, died in 1978 um, before Arthur Allen Thomas was released and before the Royal Commission of Inquiry. So sadly, he can't be questioned. Mm. Uh, but certainly, um, as in other cases where police, for example, deal with murder-suicides and uh, they find two bodies and have to piece things together, we're left with that same issue. You know, we have uh, a dead police officer who by all intents and purposes appears to be prime suspect number one. Uh, and you have uh, an inability to question him. But you can look at the circumstantial evidence and you can say, well, it's likely that he was the killer or it's likely that there needs to be a, a better investigation. One of the things that could uh, give police some clues would be to drag out his old case notes and speak to his old colleagues and people that he'd arrested and see what his modus operandi was, see if there were some similarities. Yes, a number of people have died, and this goes back to your earlier question about uh, the length of time. But I, I say to you again, you know, Rochelle Crew is a victim. She still doesn't know who killed her parents. Mm. And for 40 years, she's lived with the, uh, yes. uh, the black cloud of either that uh, your father or your mother killed one or the other or your grandfather did it. That's mm. the theory that's been put forward to exonerate Arthur. It didn't need to be put forward, but that was what they had to do. The lawyers back in those days, it's an either-or situation. Mm. If it wasn't Arthur, it had to be them. Mm. You know? That was the sort of logic that they used. <laughs> uh, now, the book's been out sub since uh, September, so what sort of response have you had from the uh, Len Johnson people? It's Well, uh, from police, uh, a mixed response. There are those who knew him and say, you, you're right up with the play, he was that sort of person and it wouldn't surprise us in the slightest if he'd done that. Mm. Um, there are others who say, well, you know, he comes from a good, respectable family, how could you do this? Sadly, uh, as in any investigation, you just simply have to go where the evidence goes. Uh, and we know as a matter of fact, established by the Royal Commission, that Johnson planted the evidence that convicted Arthur Allen Thomas. He was key right throughout this whole thing mm. in terms of gaining the conviction against Thomas. What this book does is it provides a possible motive as to why he played such a role. Mm. It wasn't just in the interest of gaining a conviction. By gaining a conviction, he got the investigation away from him and yes. the people he was protecting. Yeah. Now, what has been the reaction to the book so far? Well, the first and obvious reaction was that it provoked Rochelle Crewe to make a public comment for the mm. first time ever on the status of the police investigation. As you know, she went to the Herald and has asked for the case to be reopened. And we've lent our full support to that. Um, the second most obvious reaction is that the police decided they would investigate their own investigation, which is a Clayton sort of thing. <laughs> um, and they have, uh, they're in the process of finalising their report on that, which is due out mm. shortly. Now, I've, I've cooperated. Um, I've expressed my eagerness to see them actually do a thorough job as opposed to mm. simply going through the motions because as I started off the book by saying, you know, if you're only looking at your own box of evidence 
and you refuse to look at anything outside the box of evidence mm. you already have, then you are closing your um, uh, investigation off to any opportunities for something else to have happened. It's by stepping back from that box that you mm. know was flawed because the Royal Commission's mm. found it was a shonky investigation. It's by stepping back from that and getting a clean perspective on it that you'll get a better idea of what actually happened. But if you are limiting yourself to the information that you've already gained, mm. fraudulently in some cases, then this is going to be a Clayton's inquiry. Yeah. Now, it's available in all good bookstores. In all good bookstores, even including Whitcall still. <laughs> but uh, I'd love to, and you have, we have pre-arranged this, uh, Ian. We're going to give three copies away. Here they are, three wonderful copies of The Inside Story. And all you have to do is email jared at thebeatgoeson.co.nz. That's the simple part. And just all you have to write in the subject line is the inside story. We'll do a draw. Also include your address because we'll be posting off these books. So thank you very much, Ian. If you keep bringing out books like this every year, you'll be on the show every year for the rest of your natural <laughs> life. <laughs> What's the next one, by the way? Uh, we're working on a uh, on the Kahui case. The Kahui. Oh, that, Kahui that'll be interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. All the best.